Um, all right, tonight we have uh, Dr. Barbara Roth. Um, Dr. Roth is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Arizona. And while in graduate school, she worked for the Arizona State Museum on the Tucson Basin Survey. She has conducted research on the transition to agriculture in the Southwest and currently works in the Membrus Mogollon region of Southwestern New Mexico, examining household and community organization during the pit house and classic Pueblo periods. She has directed excavations at several pit house period sites and more recently at the Elk Ridge site, a large classic period Pueblo located in the Membrus River Valley. She has also been doing work in the Mojave Desert, examining prehistoric hunter-gatherer land use. She recently published a co-edited volume with Patricia Gilman and Roger Annie, uh, entitled New Perspectives on Membrous Archaeology, uh, published by the University of Arizona Press. So, okay, I will now turn over the screen to Dr. Roth, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm going to try to pull up my PowerPoint here and start this. Um, I'm, I have to be honest with you, most, some of you I know, or I know, and I'm, I'm used to talking and being very involved. So you'll see me moving my hands a lot. I hope that doesn't uh, affect anybody. <laughs> but, um, and I hope you will ask some questions at the end of this. Uh, this is obviously a work in progress because I'm just kind of pulling together some ideas that we've developed. One of the first things you'll notice is that I've changed the title. It was Live Lives, Individuals and Members, Pit House and Pueblo Communities. And I figured you probably didn't want to be here for like two and a half hours. So I focused it primarily on my on the Pit House work that we've been doing. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to give you a little background. And how I'm going to present this is what we as archaeologists have decided about particular sites, and then some of the insights that we've gained from looking at some individuals and some data on individuals that we've been able to glean from some of these sites. So uh, with that, I will start. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Members region, uh, Members Valley is located uh, in Southwestern New Mexico. Uh, but it's the Membrus region itself extends into uh, west, far western Arizona and down into um, northern Mexico. We still aren't really sure how far into northern Mexico. But I'm really going to focus, it also encompasses both the Gila and the Membrus River Valley. I'm really going to focus on the Membrus, uh, both the Membrus River Valley itself and then also uh, the region to the west of that. So, and Eastern Arizona, sorry, I get East and West mixed up just in case you didn't notice. So when you hear about members, what do you think about? Well, usually what you think about is pottery because that's what by far the members region is best known for, sadly, because it's led to very rampant looting uh, in the region. And you also will often think of Pueblos and these above ground ado cobble adobe Pueblos. And so this is the site of Elk Ridge. We have very typical members uh, architecture there, very typical members pottery. But we also, when we talk about members, we tend to focus in on those things. And so tonight I wanted to kind of take a different approach and look at some of the people that we have, the individuals that we've been trying to glean what they were doing. And this has comes from the fact that I was very, very, very heavily influenced by a woman named Ruth Tringham, uh, who talks about why, how we haven't been peopling the past as much. This was in 91. I think we've gotten better, but I think there's still a lot we can do. And she has a very pertinent quote here, why have archaeologists produced a prehistory of genderless, faceless blocks? Because often when we're asked to think about people, we don't really see them as individuals. So that's what I'm trying to do tonight. I'm doing it with archaeological data. So you're going to see that it's a challenge. 
I will look forward to hearing anybody's comments and ideas on this as we go forward. So I'm going to talk primarily about two pit house sites. Uh, and they're, they're really distinct pit house sites. And so we, in, in our work there, have really focused on those differences. Uh, one is called Gila Encantada. It's just north of Silver City in Little Walnut Canyon. So it's away from the major river valleys. It's quite different from the major river sites. Uh, and then we have one major river site, the Harris site, uh, which is located right around, along the river. And so I'm gonna talk about these two sites and kind of what we've gleaned from them and then some details on some of the individuals that we've been able to uh, learn some things about. So La Gila and Cantata, as I say, is north of Silver City. It sits on a ridge top. It's a relatively small site. We estimate, we did some magnetometry work there. We estimate there were about 25 pit houses total and that covers all of the late pit house period, so about from AD 550 to about the late AD 8, 8, uh, 890, early 900s. Um, we excavated all or portions of nine pit houses there. And so when we were pulling everything together, we had some ideas from our excavations based on our research questions. One of the things we were looking at is household organization how these groups were organized. We were looking at their subsistence strategies. We were looking at whether they were sedentary or not and, and really trying to compare that with what was going on in the rivers or along the river on the Gila and the uh, Nimbus River. And so our ideas from Gila and Cantata came up with after our excavations that pit house period sites, uh, this pit house period site had autonomous households. And I'm gonna, contrast that with what we're finding along the river in a little while. And that was really the fundamental social group. So basically family groups. Uh, and these households were represented by pit houses and associated extramural features, usually HARS that were outside. Um, and that these groups, at least these groups away from the river, tended to be mobile for a little bit longer, meaning that they moved around a little bit longer than what we see in the river valleys. And so at least through the San Francisco phase, so through about AD 750, and then we see a shift to, to more sedentism, to more staying in one place permanently. And that occurred, we think, because they were becoming more agriculturally focused. So to be honest with you, our original ideas were really pretty traditional archeology span ideas. We looked at households, we looked at, uh, mobility, we looked at subsistence. But through all of this, we also learned some things about people and the individuals that were living in these houses. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about right now. So this is Pit House 2, the three circle phase house. Um, why this house is interesting to us is that it burned accidentally. I'm sure it wasn't, the, the people that lived there were not thrilled. Um, we think this is the hearth right here. Uh, we think that it, the fire started in the hearth and we're not sure if it was an ember or something that went to this post. This is a post hole. That post caught on fire and all that white that you see is burned plaster. So the, almost the entire house burned except for this part back here over here. And this is the only part of the house that was completely cleaned out. So they were able to go in and get whatever didn't burn out of there. Uh, but we found some interesting things about how these folks were organizing their internal part of their house. We know that they spent most of their time outside. Uh, and so they came in for sleeping and doing obviously <laughs> small amount of cooking or heating, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but this whole back part, you can see where it's whiter, was uh, just ash. And we think it was all charred, uh, probably sleeping mats. So they, we think they were sleeping in the back of the house. Uh, there were some things stored along the wall. That's where I'm going to get to the individual in just a minute. And then we had a bunch of uh, ceramic vessels around the hearth. And so we were able to really reconstruct, whoops, uh-oh. 
reconstruct kind of what was going on in the household based on this. There was a matate stored against the wall, very typical of members pit house sites. So we were like, okay, this is pretty typical. And this is right around the hearth. One of the vessels actually fell into the hearth when the fire was, was going. Uh, so we had that vessel. These were all really nicely made. They were smaller. So we were, our inference is that this was for the family uh, because that's basically what we had found around the hearth. So you can see this vessel was about this big, very well made. It's very thin. It's very uh, finely fired, just a beautiful vessel. And most of the vessels around the hearth were like that. So the assumption, because ethnographically, we know that women were the ones that were doing the, the pottery making, the assumption is that the woman in this household was quite a good potter. So where's the individual in this? Well, there, right there is one. But my favorite part about this house wasn't what was found around the hearth, but something that was found stored along that, that wall in that area that burned. And if you look at this, this was a very tiny vessel. And you'll notice it's not very thin. It's not very finely made. And if, if, you, if I had more detail or was able to show you, uh, it's really more pinched than, than uh, uh, sh shaped. And you can see that not a lot of fine uh, line work. And so this was, in our interpretation, made by a child. Uh, but what I loved about it is I think probably many of the parents in this audience have probably kept something that their child made. Maybe not completely functional, but they kept it because they just wanted to keep it. And so what I loved about this in terms of touching an individual in this household was that one of the, the family members very carefully stored that vessel uh, over against the wall so that it was, uh, unfortunately, they couldn't find it after the fire, but it was obviously a special thing that they, they weren't, it wasn't in use, but it was obviously special to them. So uh, it made you think about the fact, or made all of us think about as we were discussing it and finding it, uh, that these were families. And we sometimes forget that when we, you know, we, we see them as genderless, faceless blogs, and we forget that these were interacting families. And it was probably pretty upsetting to have their house burned down and have to go through and get what they could out of there and rebuild it. And so, uh, again, just, just kind of thinking about how this might be. Uh, at this same site, at Gila in Katata, we had another very typical uh, early three-circled pit house. You can see here's the hearth. Uh, here's the um, hearthstone that goes toward the entryway, center post. This house also burned um, not as completely as the other one, and there were, but there were a lot of a lot of materials that were left in the house. And here is a matate, again up against the wall, very typical of the members uh, way they they left their houses. There's uh, there was also uh, a set of stacked monos, and the monos go with the matates uh, over on this side. And then we had kind of a typical household assemblage. We had ceramic vessels on the floor. This is a three circle neck corrugated jar, again, next to the hearth, probably for preparation. Uh, and so, you know, as we were going through the artifacts, coming up with our typical, okay, this is what the household was, was like. This is what the vet, we looked at the vessel size to see what the family size might have been. Uh, and a couple individual things came out. One is, and this is, again, you start thinking of these as interacting and excited families that, that were like, okay, we got to keep everybody safe here. Uh, you can see these are pretty sharp. These are, these are bone tools that we think were part of a weaving kit. And you can see how sharp these are. And this is a beautiful one, very well made, and probably wouldn't want it broken. And these, we think that we found five of them together in an area of the roof fall where it looks like they were stored up either on, in, the, in the rafters of the roof or maybe in a high bag up there. 
but you can just see somebody saying, I don't want these broken. These are my, my fit. You can, you can tell that they were very well used. These are my favorite tools. I don't want them broken. I don't want them messed with. So I'm going to put them up here so nobody can get to them. But the other part that comes out about the individual in that particular household has to do with this Matati. That Matati that was leaning against the wall. And I did the groundstone analysis on this. And I really thought this Matati was, was interesting because none of the other Matatis at the site had this shelf. You can see this kind of shelf. And my friend Jenny Adams tells me that was the mono rest. And so uh, you could see where the mono would be put up here. Um, and so it kind of came in as a set. But when I was doing the analysis, I was doing the Matate first, you can see how large this is. And I was looking at the wear patterns, I couldn't figure them out. I was like, that's a really interesting wear pattern. I, I, I can't quite figure it. And then when we started doing the, the monos, it was like, oh, because if you look at this right here, that's a hand groove for holding the mono. The woman was left-handed. And once I figured that, I'm right-handed, so it took me a while to figure that out. But once I figured that out, that all of a sudden the wear patterns fit completely, of course, because it was a left-handed pattern. So again, touching that idea that these weren't just monos and matades, but they were everyday tools in somebody's everyday life and shaping it so that it fit better in her hand, uh, getting a mono rest so that it was easier to deal with. And so all of those things just kind of let you know that yes, these, these are important data, but they also tell us a little bit about the people that were living in that house. So uh, then we go to the Mimbers River Valley. Uh, a, very, very different situation down there in the Pit House villages. Uh, we have excavated at the Harris site, which I'll talk about in just a second, but you can see much more open agricultural land. The villages down there are much larger. They're more sedentary. We think that they're doing some irrigation agriculture. So it's just a little bit different in that area. So when we started working at Harris, <coughs> Harris is in kind of the middle portion of the Members Valley. It was first dug by Emil Howery uh, in the 1930s. Emil uh, Howery dug at the southern end of the site, and then we have dug uh, at the northern end of the site. So we have data. We have some data from Howery, and then we also have uh, abundant data from our excavations. We were there from 2008 to 2013. So. We were there for quite a while. So again, I'm going to give you the background of the what were our original uh, research questions and how are we going to approach this archaeologically as kind of typical archaeologists. Because I was so interested in household organization and what happened to households, that was our primary goal, to look at household organization, how that changed over time, and then the interplay of how households were organized, how that related to them being sedentary, how that related to the subsistence strategies, what were, were they farming, what were they doing, and again, did that change over time? So the results of our excavations at, at Harris showed us that there were three levels of organization. We had autonomous households, much like what we find at Gila and Gattata. Uh, we had household clusters, and I'll talk about those clusters in a minute, and then we had the overall community. And so we kind of looked at each one of those uh, levels of organization to try to get at uh, all those research questions that we wanted to look at. Household organization, change over time, what caused the change over time. Through time, we also got really interested in how the community was organized. And that led us to a very different view on individuals, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So, uh, so we have these pit house clusters. These are uh, clusters of, of, of clusters of pit houses. That's why they're called pit house clusters, right? Uh, <laughs> clusters that share certain traits, usually architectural and artifact traits that are unique from others uh, at the site. So for example, 
this particular cr cluster shared uh, having pots plastered in the floor. And then they, sh they usually share a common work area that often has a storage, a large storage pit and other evidence of, that, of work activities sometimes also had burials. Um, usually each of these house clusters had a superimposed house. And what that means is a house that was uh, where you had a floor and then you, they either dismantled it or after the, these pit houses lasted about 25 years before they got pretty messy and uninhabitable and um, the uh, insects would eat the, the logs, the beams. So after a while, they would have to either move or dismantle. And so what they would do in these superimposed houses is they would then build another house in that same architectural footprint. And so we think that these superimposed houses, they tend to be in the center of these clusters were, were quite important. We call them founding households, probably heads of households. Uh, but we think that these represent, why we're so en en enamored with these is we think that they re represent extended family corporate groups. So we've really seen a change in the way that households are organized from these autonomous households to these uh, clusters uh, that represent extended family corporate groups. Now we still see autonomous households. Not everybody was in one of these clusters. So you have a, a mixed village there of these land, what we think are land holding families, and then these autonomous families that may have may have been related uh, may, through a whole variety of means. Uh, we think this is all tied to the agricultural land that was down below the site. I'm standing on the edge of the site now that possibly irrigation agriculture, but certainly agriculture was part of why land holding, land tenure was part of the development of this. Uh, so I said that we had these pit house clusters and then we had these autonomous households. The other thing that we have evidence of, and part of, a lot of this data comes from actual Howie's work, is that they were integrated, they were brought together through uh, the use of great kivas. And so in the center of the site, there is a large plaza and around that plaza are sequentially used great kivas that go from the Georgetown phase, which is the initial occupation of the site, all the way through to the end of the occupation. And this includes one very large uh, great kiva used in the uh, late AD 800s and early 900s uh, that was excavated by Howry. And so, and this is one uh, Daryl Krill and Roger Anion have identified a series of uh, large great kivas throughout the valley that were burned uh, in the 900s. Uh, the dating varies, but in general in the 900s, um, that they were intentionally burned and ritually retired. And this is uh, one of those kivas and the one that Howie excavated. So we know that these kivas played very important roles in bringing that community together. Uh, so Barb, you say, where are the individuals? Well, I'm gonna talk about one of the clusters that we have. It dates to the San Francisco phase, AD 650 to 750. Uh, it's, we called it cluster three because it was the third cluster we found. Um, they're also, and, and you'll see this right here is Howry, one of Howry's um, houses. And we think that that house, it also had a pot plastered in the floor. So we think it was part of that cluster. And it certainly opened onto this common, air, common use area right in here. We also had a number of autonomous households that were occupied at this time. Uh, we have a a great kiva dating to the San Francisco phase that Howry dug portions of. And we think that Howry had another cluster at the south end of the site. Uh, we don't have really good data on that, but it, uh, the data that we do have suggests that it was. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, whoops, one of this house right here. Uh, no, this one right here, 43 which is one of the houses in this cluster. And talk a little bit about uh, the inhabitants of that house. 
So you'll see it's a very typical member's house. It's got a uh, central hearth with the hearthstone facing the entryway, center post back here. And, and this house was interesting because they cleaned it out completely before they, they burned it. And we think that they retired it and I'll explain why in a second. But they completed, completely cleaned it out. Except, and here's where you get your individual, because uh, they burned the front part of the house. They didn't burn the whole house completely. <laughs> but one of these little pits right in here contained all of this really, really nice fine grain material. And I just realized as I was putting this together this weekend that I don't have pictures of those. So I'm going to have to get some of them. Uh, but it, a lot of really nice fine grain lithic material. Now, the funny part about this, and this is what makes you, you interested in the fact that people, individuals behave like individuals sometimes, is that, remember I said that these clusters had communal storage areas outside. So if you look at the communally stored uh, cores, the raw material, it was okay. You know, it was not bad. It was basalt. It, there was some rhyolite. There's a little bit of chert but it wasn't great. And so all the really nice material, <laughs> and there wasn't a lot of it, but all the nice material was stored in this pit inside. And so uh, it's, it's just very typical of, okay, I'm gonna share, but I'm gonna keep, I'm, I'm a flint napper. So the, the probably, again, ethnographically, probably the male saying, but I'm gonna keep some of the best stuff just in here where, where I can have access to it. And then unfortunately they forgot to take it when they clean, because they cleaned out this house. There was nothing on that floor. And so uh, unfortunately they forgot to take the, the nice raw material, but that way we got to see it and got to analyze it and, and uh, look at how they were, clearly the, this was being used to make the really uh, very formal, very, very uh, uh, nice tools, not just the expedient flakes that they were using in their everyday daily activities. The other interesting thing about this house, so you've got the individual male uh, and, and his, his lithic cache, uh, but the other really interesting thing about this house was when they uh, closed it down, which they clearly did, like I say, they, they uh, cleaned it out and then they burned the front part of it, is we found this rock on the floor and when we lifted up the rock, there was a pot underneath. <clears throat> and it was plastered into the floor. It's one of the ways we distinguished it as part of that cluster. And so when we, we, of course, I don't think that they thought anybody would ever come in and dig that pot out, but we did. And so it was a reused jar. It was a jar that had been used clearly before and then put in and probably used as a kind of mewing bin. We did find quite a bit of corn pollen and other kinds of uh, evidence of subsistence activities in it. So they were probably using it as either to, to when they were uh, grinding or to put stuff in and store. Um, but the interesting thing about the pot was that, and we were assuming that this was done before they closed the house down is they uh, killed the pot. They drilled a hole into it. And so the, the inference there, and there's a lot of work that's being done. Bill Walker has been doing a lot of this very interesting stuff on animism. And certainly we see that as, as an example of that not only were these houses, housed families and active families and people doing all kinds of stuff, but they also were part of them. They, they really saw them as a, a manifestation uh, that was important and they clearly did not want somebody coming back in and, and doing something. And so uh, um, we, we really have learned a lot from and, and kind of changed our methods a little bit in how we do things after finding this. Uh, but it was really an interesting thing to think about how that it, what we always think about people, which is true, but that these objects were also very, very much alive to them. Okay, so 
as through time, what happened at Harris was that it just got to be a bigger and bigger and bigger site. And as it gets to be bigger, obviously you've got more people to deal with, you've got more activities to, to kind of coordinate. And so we see, again, the important roles of these kivas. I'm gonna talk about uh, this particular one, Cadastre 55, which is a three circle face kiva. Um, these clusters continue to grow and thrive. We get additional clusters added. Um, but we also think that we begin to see really the fact that marking land tenure becomes important. And so I'm gonna talk about kind of a change in the role of individuals, because in this case uh, that I'm gonna talk about next, uh, it wasn't just the individual that was critical to this, but in fact, the lineage. And so I'm gonna talk about uh, what we think was happening was that some of these, and we, this one in particular, I'm not gonna talk about that one tonight because I, I don't wanna keep you here all night, uh, but this one and this one, the, the ones on the opposite ends on the plaza, of the plaza we think were especially important in uh, overseeing these rituals. And we think they were sponsoring the rituals. And so I'm gonna explain why we think that they were, that were involved in the rituals. This is uh, Pit House 55. This is the Great Kiva. It's a, it's a three circle face Kiva that was occupied before uh, the very large one that Howie dug. And so, like I said, we've got sequential use of these and this was occupied kind of after the San Francisco phase before uh, the very late three circle one. And we excavated a portion of it. We, we excavated, we found the entryway. Uh, this is a step coming in from the entryway. We, we found the hearth and the center post. And so we excavated the kiva and uh, we're looking at the way this kiva was used to integrate these groups. It was also ritually retired. We've looked at how it was retired. So kind of the, the, the regular things about kivas but we also found outside, directly in front of the entryway, in the plaza, you can see they're in the plaza right here. We found what we're interpreting as, we call it a feasting pit. It was a pit, we only excavated a portion of it, but it was a pit that uh, had, uh, with a, a number of smashed vessels. And originally we thought it might be a cremation, but it, there was no human remains in it. And the pit, the stack of ceramics, was at least 50 centimeters and they were all stacked on top of each other. So what, and, and once we started doing the analysis, we found all these big decorated jars. And so the assumption is that this was part of a ritual feast that we're interpreting because it's right outside the entryway to Pit S55, that it was part of the closure of, of Pit S55, of that great Kiva. And couple things I want to want to talk about that, that's going to link to the individual I'm going to discuss. But first of all, I want to say that this was 2013 and it was the, the wildfires that year were terrible. And I know we're continuing to have them. There was another one there this year. Uh, and we were, we were pretty scared during that time. So it's just been sadly in that region, it's been a real issue uh, of late these wildfires. So, so that is in fact wildfire smoke that you're seeing in the background. Um, but I wanna talk about some artifacts that were found in this pit. So we had all these smashed vessels, these smashed jars, and then there was a layer of, of ash. And in that ash were two snapped pallets. Pallets are uh, stone. Um, I don't have a picture of one that, that's not broken, but. Uh, in the Mimbris region, they're, they're stone, flat slabs of stone, sometimes with a little bit of decoration on the edges, nothing like what we find in the Hocom area. We don't see the level of decoration that we find in the Hocom region, but uh, uh, they, they were used. And so we, we have, we had two snapped pallets in this layer. And then I want this vessel, this was what vessel was found in the feasting pit. And so why I'm stressing these two objects 
is because back to cluster five, if you go to cluster five over here, we had a superimposed house. And so again, two floors, one on the bottom, one on the top. We had a woman buried in the trash up fill of this house so that she went through the top floor and was seated on the bottom floor of this house. And with her were two snapped pellets and a vessel that was almost identical to this vessel. In fact, we thought that it, we had made a mistake at first and, and that we, it was like, wait a minute, these can't be, are you sure that, that we had the, them labeled correctly? From, we, we did not bring any artifacts from the burials in. Uh, they were all analyzed in place and left in place. And so we, we were like, wait a minute, what's this doing here? So they were so similar uh, that we think that they were probably made by the same person, possibly by this woman. Uh, and the significance, again, why I'm talking about this individual is because we don't think the importance in, in, in her burial was just her. We think that she represented the ritual sponsorship by that household and the importance of that household. Uh, now, again, another kind of aside of that is as you go out this, this entryway, if you look to the left, there was an extra mule there, uh, area there, and there was an older male buried there who had had a really, really bad fall. He had uh, uh, broken his femur, his ulna, and his humerus, and all healed. Uh, but clearly, the idea is that this was an important family, and uh, and she was the one that was holding that lineage for whatever reasons, which we're still investigating. Uh, but a different kind of role of an individual there in that, in that perpetuating that uh, lineage marker. Okay, so I have a couple more minutes. I wanna talk about some of the autonomous households uh, at Harris, two of them in particular. I talk about Pitas 44 and Pit House 42. And so 44 is, as you saw on the edge of the, the site, it wasn't a particularly well-made house. Uh, we don't know if it, it was small. We don't know if it was a small family, uh, but even though it wasn't part of a cluster and it wasn't, uh, it didn't have a lot of the, the uh, artifacts and things associated with the clusters, which we think tend to be those land, important land holding uh, families, it still was very much so tied in to what was going on at Harris. And we think tied into what was going on as that community gathered. Uh, for one thing, the entryway, you can see the entryway here, the entryway faced Cook's Peak. And Cook's Peak is a very important uh, item on the landscape uh, for Harris. Many of the uh, houses face Cook's Peak. Uh, Great Kiva 10, the one that Howie dug, faces Cook's Peak. So we know that Cook's Peak, uh, the, the house that I just talked about with the woman buried through the floors faces Cook's Peak. So it was very, very important to these groups. And so this house, uh, even though it was an autonomous household not linked to the others, it faced Cook's Peak. And then in the house was some interesting stuff. The house, as I say, wasn't very well built. And so it, this entire side of the house collapsed in a mudslide. And much like the house that I showed you earlier that burned, not, hardly anything was found over on this side. It was cleaned out. But on this side, buried underneath all that mud, we found a lot of material. And so we found uh, evidence of male activities. We found a stone ax. You can't really see it in the photos. Very, very heavily used stone ax. And there was a sharpening stone with it. And so that was stored along here. We found a giant core uh, that was also stored along uh, the side of the wall. So again, showing us that there was uh, a male living in the household. We also, of course, found pottery, so very likely it was a family. Um, 
But the other interesting thing we found, and it's hard to show in pictures, but this is pitting and there was a jar stored on this side. And there's really intense pitting in that jar. And we think that that jar was used to ferment something. It's very consistent with what Harry Schaefer has found in, at Nan Ranch in the Southern Valley. It's very consistent with what um, Miles Miller has found in the Hornada region. And so we're, we're curious whether the individuals in this household were fermenting things so that they could take it to the, to the community uh, feasts and the community activities and kind of fit in in that way. Even though they weren't part of one of these clusters, they were still very obviously active participation, participants in uh, that village. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, the last autonomous household I want to talk about, and you're going, wait a minute, Barb, that's not members. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, this is Mesa Verde. But why I'm showing this first is because I want you to see what a real uh, ventilator deflector system looks like, okay? A ventilator brings in air. The deflector stone is in front of the hearth so that uh, it deflects, uh, it deflects the, the heat back into the room. And you can still have fresh air, but you're not gonna have cold fresh air. You're gonna have heat back in the room. So we don't find deflector stones in Mimbrus, except in one of our houses, uh, one of our autonomous houses. This is a very, very typical Mimbrus house. Uh, it, unfortunately, we dug it right as the monsoons hit, so it's kind of a messy house right now. Uh, but typical four by four meters center post. These were storage pits in the floor. And the, this storage pit was uh, full of pottery tools uh, and very, very typical membrous pottery. It was brownware. It was, there, there was some uh, hematite for... for uh, um, grinding and so just a kind of a typical I would ne never have thought anything of this house except we had what I call a faux deflector and you'll notice there's some digging behind there that was me looking for a ventilator I thought is there a vent no it was flat wall uh, and so there was no ventilator there is there is a deflector so we're trying to figure out what this means. We, we have some uh, Cibola wear from, from northern wear from north, uh, north of the Members Valley. So was there somebody living in here who thought that the only proper house had a ventilator? Possibly. And that's why, why I'm, I'm ending this with saying that sometimes we have more questions <laughs> than we have answers. But it sure looks like there was an individual in that house that thought that the house needed a deflector stone in order to be a proper house. Um, I'm going to close with, because uh, I'm not going to have time to talk about the Pueblo, but that, more to come. I'm going to close with one of my favorite pictures. Uh, these, as you know, there, there were a series of, of uh, photographers that went through the Southwest, and they would often they would often take pictures of people. But sometimes, when they wanted architecture, they'd make everybody move. And so it was like, okay, everybody get out. We want a, a picture of what what I see as sometimes the way we, as archaeologists, look at things static. Okay, static architecture. There it is. But if you look very closely. There's a dog back there. And it's one of my favorite pictures because it shows that these were not static villages. They were active, they were viable, there were dogs, there were kids, there were all kinds of things. And I think that we gain a better understanding of how the past was when we start to think about those individuals. So. We, we are gonna to continue to try to do that. We're trying, this is our, our little area of Elk Ridge that we're finishing up all the analysis right now. And we're gonna to try to pull together some of this as well and look at some of these individuals. So uh, thank you. And I, I hope you have some questions.
and some comments. I'd love to hear from everybody. Good. Thank you so much. You're really pushing us to think about things in a broader way. I love that. Um, so um, we do have questions and I'm going to start with one that um, is just about your book before we get into the details of the, of the presentation. Um, and this person wants to know, does the new perspectives in Mimbris archaeology also cover information about the Mojave Desert? Because you no. mentioned that you worked there before. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's, a, no, that's my side gig is the Mojave Desert. I do, I do that in the winters. <laughs> so, you can't okay. work in the Mojave in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so let's get into it. Um, so how deep were the pit? portions of the pit houses? Uh, they vary usually about a meter and a half below ground surface, uh, but it really depend, depends on where on the, the terrace they were. Some of them were like the, the 44, the, the autonomous household, that was only about, I think it was 70 centimeters deep. So it really varies. But what they would do, and I, I thought about, I should have done that is, what they would do is they would dig uh, probably about a meter below their ground surface and then build a superstructure of wood above it and, and, and mud and other kinds of things to cover it. So they were really great places to live as long as the bugs didn't eat all your wood. <laughs> okay, um, so um, you talked about not having deflector stones. What do you think the hearthstones were used for then? You know, oh, that's such a great question. We have gone back and forth. Even we have all this hearth data because it's so typical of Mimbrus. And we we don't know what because they're just and usually they're flat. So they just mark the edge of the hearth. But they, you know, you would think if they were using it for something kind of functional, that they would slab line the whole hearth and they don't. It's just that one edge. So one thing is that they use it to rest things on, but it seems to be more, almost more of an identity mark than an actual functional kind of thing because it's very typical. Not all members hearts have them, but a lot of them do. Pit house, but by the Pueblo period, they're doing the slab line mark. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, um, how or why do you use the definition Great Kiva as compared to the same term in the Chaco area? <laughs> oh, yes, great question. We used to call them communal structures to, to distinguish them from great kivas, but they are very much so used in the way, if you look at the traditional way that great kivas were uh, defined, which is as the ceremony, not just for communal, because communal, you think, oh, just gathering, that there were important rituals, we think, that were going on in them. So we've moved, we, and I mean, we as member scholars have moved more probably in the last decade to calling them great kivas. Now, it's very important, though, uh, for because I, I, I'm sure a lot of people on here have, have looked at, at Chaco. These are not like Chaco great kivas. They're nothing on that kind of the formality and the scale. And so, so they're, they're, I think they are very much so great kivas, but they're not equivalent. So they just show the variability in great kivas that you see across the Southwest. Can you uh, describe, you, you mentioned a couple of times the three circle phase of great kivas. Can you talk about what that is? Yeah, the three circle phase is just a time period. So it's a, it starts about 750 and runs to about a thousand. So what, what happens, and, and this is a great question because up until that time, we think a lot of the, the you, could, you could debate with me on whether we can call those great kivas because they don't have the same formal characteristics that we see in the late ones. And so, uh, so by the three circle phase, they are clearly great kivas. And I think most everyone would re agree on that that works in the region. But the earlier ones, they, they probably were somewhat multifunctional. So, okay. but we have an art, if you get interested in great kivas, Robert Stokes has a book coming out on great kivas through U University of Utah Press. I think it's coming out in early 2023 and across the, the Southern Southwest. And we do have a, a chapter in there on our great kivas. 
So, but it, he's got, it's a great volume. I'll plug it. Great. Thanks. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, what was the function of the snapped palettes? Oh, the palettes. Mm -hmm. We don't have a clue. Uh, we, you know, the, in the Holcomb region, they seem to have been associated with a uh, cremation rituals, but we find palettes in domestic contexts. They're not always, th these particular ones I mentioned were found in, in, uh, uh, ritual con I mean, certainly the feasting pit with the closing of the kiva, but a lot of the pallets we find in the Nimbus region are just in domestic context. We had one at Gila and Cantata in an extramural area. So, so they're not, we don't think they're functionally equivalent to the ones that were in the Hokam area. And we're not really sure what, what they, you know, they, they don't seem to have been used for grinding pigment. They don't seem, so we're, we're not really sure what they were used for. They, the weird thing is, they have heavy use. A lot of them you can see where they've been uh, used, but we're just, if you have any ideas, let me know because we're just, we don't know. I'm gonna stick with uh, different artifacts that you found then. There's a few questions related to those. So um, how about, were there any bowls in the feasting pit or mostly jars? Mostly, there were bowls. There were a few bowls, I'd have to check. No, my numbers, I don't want to, but many more jars than bowls, but there were some bowls. So again, feasting, serving. The, do, we, do we have time? To, can I tell you one little funny sure, story? Sure. One of the jars is so beautifully made, just gorgeous. And you look at the bottom and the bottom isn't, nothing's done to the bottom. It's just plain. So we, we have debated whether when, when they, she made the vessel, if she said, well, they're just gonna smash it anyway, so I'm, and they're gonna have it sitting out there, so I'm not gonna bother decorating the bottom because the bottom is just completely different from this very beautiful, elaborate uh, jar decoration. So you, sometimes you get these little snippets in there. Yeah, interesting. Uh, all right. Um, in the pits, did you, in the storage pits, did you ever find caches of personal items like jewelry, bracelets, necklaces, et cetera? Occasionally, but usually not. Uh, in the inside, I shouldn't say that, on, in the outside ones. In the outside ones, it's almost always uh, cores, uh, lithic tools sometimes, and ground stone. Where we tend to find those kinds of things, the jewelry and everything is, is uh, of course, a lot of times they were buried with people, but then we, we will also find them inside. So we don't usually tend to find those in those outside. The outside storage pits were used, to, uh, we think that the big ones were used for corn, as almost corn cribs. And then the other pits, it's almost always lithics and groundstone that's stored out there. Great. All right, for the killed pot, that was found in the floor. Is that flake away patterning common for drilling? I'm wondering because it also looked like the exit of blowout from the force damage. And it could have been, yeah. That I mean, we, one of the things that we haven't really finalized is how it was done. Is is exactly how it was killed? Like, was it was it punched, or was it? I think I said drilled, but we're not. That's not. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Because it could very well have been punched. Okay. And I think that's what the person is, is getting at. All right. Um, is there any indication that the pallets in domestic context were just square plates used for serving food? No, because they're tiny. They're about that big. So about the size of a mouse. <laughs> so, so not, yeah. I mean, unless you were serving little teeny tiny pieces of food. No. It's, it's, re, it's just really interesting. And did you say there was no residue on those pallets at all? There was nothing you could- see? No, no visible residue. Yeah. We, we didn't do residue analysis on them, but there was no, like no uh, red, a lot of the ones in, in the Hocom area sometimes, will, not a lot, but will sometimes have pigment on them and we had no pigment on any of ours. And that's true of any of the ones we found across Harris and Gila and Kandata. Okay. How about shell? Did you find any shell artifacts? If so, what we, artifact form and what type of shell? 
Oh, we found all kinds of shell. We found uh, bracelets, of course, lots and lots of bracelets. We don't have any evidence of, of uh, manufacturing, so they're probably trading for those. Uh, and we found pendants and we found um, be all kinds of different beads. Yeah, we have a lot, quite a bit of shell. Mm -hmm. Mostly might, personal jewelry. I think you might have answered some of this, but um, what evidence leads you to suggest the pit houses at La Gila and Cantata burned accidentally? Oh, because everything was there. I mean, it, it really did look. Usually when, when they clean it, we, we have like partially depleted one. It's why I think that the pit house eight wasn't burnt uh, uh, accidentally, but because pit house two, there was literally everything in there. Nothing had been, including that what we are inferring to be the sleeping mats, but we had piles of, of debitage. We had pile, we had pretty much a day, uh, what you would have inside your house. We think that, that it was burned during a time of the year when they could be outside because of what we didn't find inside, which is, is evidence of a lot of, um, uh, and also just human, you're not gonna, gonna be flint napping inside, but uh, we think that they were doing a lot of the grinding and things like that outside. There was one here about any cremation burials been found? Been, have any cremation burials been found at pre membrous classic pit house sites? And if so, did they tend to be in plaza and non house areas like they were in the classic membrous pueblos? Yes. Uh, Howry found, we didn't find any, but Howry found two at Harris, and they were both in that plaza area. All right, let's see. A couple of others here. Um, Perhaps the hearthstones were used to warm food without putting them into the fire. We sometimes that, do that, there, right? They would have gotten, yeah, they would yeah. have gotten warm, so. Um, what's the criteria of individual dwellings to define them as different from the cluster component? What What is cri the criteria of the individual oh, dwellings? That, so the, the fact that they're spatially distinct and that there, there's no, uh, like they don't have common work, area. they have their own individual work areas. So they don't have any of that shared, they don't have the shared traits that the clusters have and they don't have the shared space that the clusters have. Thanks. All right, you discussed that the large Great Kiva at the Harris site that was excavated by Howry was burned. Was this a different process than the burning of Kivas at Membrus sites associated with development of the Pueblo phase? No, this, it's uh, it, Howry's 10, Howry's great uh, Kiva 10 is part of the, the group that Creel and Daryl Creel and Roger Anion identified. So there's one at Old Town, there's one at Galaz, there's one at Swartz. It's part of that whole group of great Kivas that are, that are ritually retired. And, and uh, Harris was one of those. When you refer to land tenure or land control, are you referring to lands other than those occupied by the house clusters, for example, nearby agricultural land and that sort of thing? Right now, our, our data point to the clusters, the, the extended families as, as uh, being the, the land holders. And so, but again, this is all inference. We don't have any, uh, any set like this, plots of land that, I mean, we have that whole great, huge area of arable land, but it's all based on infer, inference, a lot of it from ethnographic and, and uh, uh, data on how land was parceled out, especially by irrigation agriculturists. Okay, um, along the same lines, um, when you use those terms, corporate groups and land tenure, can you expand on those ideas at the level of the individuals? No. And that's what, I mean, really, because we can't, we don't, except for like that woman I talked about where we can kind of link the fact that the lineage was, was doing that. And it's really interesting that you asked that question because it's something we're really kind of going with, with Elk Ridge, where we're trying to, we know we have these corporate households and it's like, how are we gonna get it? And, and it's really hard to get at I mean, you, that's why you talk about roots, right? <laughs> Instead of individuals, because it's really hard, unless you have just, just concrete data, it's really hard to get down to that level of an individual. 
So on the same vein, um, any evidence of political or social hierarchy? Oh, I think so, but I'm, I'm in the minority. Um, I think that these corporate households, uh, they, they have, uh, they're, they're wealthier. Uh, they, I think that they had some social power. Now, what does that mean, right? It, not a hierarchy by any means, but they certainly had more social status, if you want to say that. I don't, I don't even like to word, I like to use the word social power because I think it was flexible and I think it was situational. And in other words, I think you could lose it uh, if, if, unless you were co cooperating and collaborating, I think you could lose that social power. But I do think that there were some pow power differentials. All right, I think I just have a couple more here. Um, great presentation, very informative. What was the reason for retiring the house? Were the members of mobile culture? So that is another, I, I know that they've done a lot of work, the Crow Canyon has done a lot of work on this in the, in the Mesa Verde region to look at why they were burning these houses. There are multiple reasons that they were doing this. So retiring these houses is, uh, one is they were just moving. They were moving to another house. Uh, and so they burned it down to get rid of all those termites and all the other stuff. Uh, other theories are that somebody died in the household and that they would burn them down then. But, but we, it just seems to be a very much so patterned behavior that they would retire these households when they were leaving them. And so, again, we, we kind of link it back to that animism. If, you're, if your house is a part of your being and, and, and it's an animate kind of thing to you, then you want to make sure you treat it carefully as you retire it. So we think that, that some of that was going on. All right, um, how about water? How close to water sources were these pit houses and did you find any evidence of water gathering or saving? We, no, the river was literally just right down from them. They, it, we, you could get down there so easily. And so we find big jars and we think that they just went down there and got the big jars full of water and came back up. This was long before, you can't do that now because there are so many cows, but <laughs> you could have, and probably the river was much higher then too, so. Yeah. All right, I do see one more and I lost it here for a second. <laughs> oh, I see a couple more. Um, do you think there was significance to the floor level that was dug down to the to for the, the female burial in that special house? Yeah. I think that we think the fact that she was placed in the trash and dug specifically so she was seated on that low, lower floor just connected. We see it as really connecting her lineage and her family through time because that earlier house was pretty early uh, compared to when she was buried. So, I mean, at least a generation, or maybe even two. Um, and in regions where there's typically where there typically are deflectors, is there ethnographic information about symbolic association of the deflectors that may have made a non-functional deflector meaning to have in a house? Not that I know of. Uh, but again, certainly if you look at any of the, the uh, Pueblo ethnographies, there are very clear things that you did to make a proper house. And, and what you had to do, uh, you know, a lot of times it's offerings that, that you did uh, in, in, for example, the corners of the house and things like that. So in a way it could make sense that, but I've never seen any information on deflector stones as reflecting that. And um, maybe you used this term, does the term landholder imply some private ownership? Not, not, we don't think that there was private ownership per se. We think that perhaps the corporate groups had specific plots that they had. So, so, but not private ownership in the sense of it was my land. It would have, it would have been the, the group's land, the extended families. All right. Well, thanks. I think that's all the questions I see here, unless another one pops up. Um, but we really appreciate your being with us tonight, Barb. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, do you have anything you'd like to say to? No, thank you.
thank you everybody for coming and hopefully one day we'll all be back in person. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much and good night everyone. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you either at Pecos or um, in September for the next lecture. Thanks. Good night.